Hi, welcome to my ECG video blog. I'm Ken Grauer, and this is my 15th ECG video blog. Today's topic is assessment of QRST changes. This assessment is a fundamental part of our systematic approach to ECG interpretation. My goal is to suggest a structure to streamline your assessment in a way that important findings are not left out, and then to illustrate how to apply this essential component of systematic interpretation when assessing the ECG for changes of ischemia or infarction. As always, for your convenience, I've made a website that lists key links to my ECG blog, my video blogs, and my introductory and advanced books and EPUBs on ECG interpretation. My email address is ekgpress at mac.com. Please write me with your comments, feedback, and questions. On to today's topic. I'll begin with a brief philosophical perspective on the overall process of ECG interpretation. In my opinion, the key to ECG interpretation is to develop a systematic approach, regardless of whether the system you use is mine or some other system, the clinical reality is that unless you routinely incorporate some systematic way for assessing each and every ECG you encounter, potentially important findings will be missed. The system I use is divided into two basic parts. Step one is descriptive analysis. This first step is easy because all you do is describe the ECG findings you see. There is no interpretation involved in this step. It is only in step two which is formulation of the clinical impression, that we consider the clinical scenario. The most common mistake I see, not only among beginning, but also among more advanced interpreters, is to jump to step two, that is, interpretation, before completing the essential first step of descriptive analysis. For example, Consider the symmetric T-wave inversion we see here in leads V1, V2, and V3 of the schematic tracing. What do you think this is due to? Is it ischemic? If so, is it a new finding? Does this T-wave inversion reflect an acute coronary syndrome with possible acute MI? Or is the anterior T-wave inversion we see more likely the result of acute pulmonary embolism? While you contemplate your answer, what if I were to tell you that the patient was a completely healthy young child with a normal exam? The point to emphasize is that clinical interpretation of this tracing may be very different depending on the clinical scenario. But regardless of what the clinical scenario might be, our descriptive analysis will remain the same. That is, there are fairly deep and symmetric T-wave inversions in leads V1, V2, and V3. What this might mean must await our analysis in step two. Assuming there were no other remarkable findings on the ECG, symmetric T-wave inversion, as seen here, could reflect ischemia if the patient was an adult with anginal type chest pain. It might even reflect an acute event if onset of symptoms was new and associated with positive troponins. If, rather than chest pain, the patient presented with acute shortness of breath, anterior T-wave inversion, as seen here, might instead suggest acute pulmonary embolism. On the other hand, if the patient was a healthy, playful young child being investigated for what was thought to be an innocent heart murmur, then anterior T-wave inversion seen here would most probably reflect the common normal variant known as a juvenile T-wave pattern. The point to emphasize is that assessment of QRST changes is part of descriptive analysis. 
the clinical significance of any ECG findings identified during this initial assessment step should not be contemplated until clinical correlation is made during the step two part of our interpretation. This distinction between descriptive analysis versus clinical interpretation should become clearer as we work through the rest of this video. Before we begin our focus on specifics of what to look for in assessment of QRST changes, let's complete our overall perspective of the systematic approach to ECG interpretation that we favor. We always start with step one, which is descriptive analysis. There are six parameters to assess in this first step. These are rate, rhythm, intervals, including assessment of the PR, QRS, and QT intervals, axis, chamber enlargement, and QRST changes. We suggest assessing these six parameters in the sequence we show here, since doing so avoids the trap of thinking there may be ischemia, infarction, or hypertrophy, when in fact the problem is a non-sinus rhythm or QRS widening from a conduction defect or metabolic disturbance. Note that assessing for QRST changes is the last component of our descriptive analysis, so we only address this parameter after we have determined what the rhythm is and after we have established if a conduction defect is or is not present. As we have already mentioned, we then conclude our interpretation with step two, which is our clinical impression of what the ECG findings detected in the descriptive analysis step are likely to mean given the clinical scenario of this particular patient. So, what do we mean by assessment of QRST changes? The purpose of this memory aid is simply to remind us to look in each of the 12 leads for the presence of Q waves and both ST segment and T wave abnormalities. This leaves us with the R of the QRST, which reminds us not to forget to assess the otherwise all too easily overlooked parameter of R wave progression. Let's illustrate these concepts with a case. How would you interpret this ECG? Given the Q waves, or rather QS complexes, that we see in the anterior leads in association with ST elevation in these leads, is this patient having an acute ST elevation MI? Hint, why should you ignore these questions and instead interpret this ECG by a systematic approach using the sequence we suggested on the previous slide? The answer is simply that without routine use of a systematic approach, it is all too easy to jump on what looks to be obvious findings, like the Q waves and leads V1, V2, and V3, with ST elevation in each of these leads, without appreciating that the rhythm is not sinus and that the QRS is wide. By the sequential systematic approach, that is, sequentially looking at rate, rhythm, intervals, axis, chamber enlargement, and only then looking at QRST changes, we can see that the rhythm is irregularly irregular without P waves in any lead. This defines the rhythm as atrial fibrillation, seen here with a fairly rapid ventricular response. As for intervals, there is no PR interval when the rhythm is AFib. Given the rapid rate, we need not concern ourselves with the QT interval. However, the QRS complex is wide. A look at leads 1, V1, and V6 confirms that the reason for QRS widening is complete left bundle branch block. We can now continue with our systematic assessment knowing that the patient has AFib, and that the reason for QRS widening is complete left bundle branch block. Both Q waves and ST elevation, as seen here in the anterior leads, 
are consistent with left bundle branch block and are not diagnostic of either acute ischemia or infarction. Bottom line, it is essential to interpret each and every ECG you encounter by a sequential systematic approach. With these key concepts as introduction, let's now explore that part of our systematic approach that we call assessing for QRST changes. We'll look at the four components of QRST changes one by one. For clarity, this slide again shows the sequential systematic approach that I favor for interpreting each and every ECG you encounter with six key parameters being included within the descriptive analysis step. So, you've assessed the first five parameters of the descriptive analysis step. That is, you've determined the rate and rhythm, assessed the three intervals, determined the axis, assessed for chamber enlargement, and are now ready to address the last parameter in our systematic approach, which is to look for signs of ischemia and or infarction by applying the QRST memory aid. We start by looking in each of the 12 leads for the presence of Q waves. The importance of Q waves is that they may be a marker of infarction. Let's start with the definition of what we mean by a Q wave. If the first deflection of the QRS complex is negative, we define this negative deflection as being a Q wave within the red oval. The positive deflection that follows this Q wave is an R wave. If we saw a negative deflection after the R wave, it would be called an S wave. So use of the term Q wave is reserved for the initial negative deflection, if there is one, that comes before the R wave. For the purpose of terminology, as well as for the purpose of our written communication, we distinguish between QRS deflections that are written with a small case versus a capital letter. I've arbitrarily selected an amplitude of three millimeters as the upper limit of a small case letter deflection. So the Q wave within the green oval would qualify as a small case Q wave, whereas the Q wave within the red oval is written with a capital letter because this Q wave is obviously deeper and wider than the small case Q wave. This brings us to what is known as a QS deflection. Note that there is no positive component, that is, no R wave, in this all negative QRS complex. As a result, we cannot tell if this negative deflection occurs before or after the positive deflection because there is no positive deflection. So we compromise by calling this all negative complex a QS wave. QS waves are most commonly seen in the anterior chest leads, although they may occur elsewhere. Clinical implications of a QS complex are the same as the clinical implications of a Q wave, namely that QS complexes may serve as a marker for infarction, especially if seen in two or more neighboring leads. This highlights the very close attention we need to devote to distinguishing whether the initial QRS deflection is up or down. Although tiny, there is an initial positive deflection in this last example within the red circle, so that this is an RS complex. Since the initial deflection is up, in the form of a very small but definitely present initial R wave, there is no Q wave. Clinically, this makes it much less likely that there has been prior infarction. What then are normal septal Q waves? Let's work out the answer to this question by retracing the path of normal ventricular activation. The electrical impulse normally begins in the SA node. From there, the activation wavefront is rapidly transmitted through the atria to the AV node by specialized intraatrial pathways. Once through the AV node, 
The impulse is rapidly conducted through the bundle branch and his Purkinje system to all parts of the ventricles. Key point. What is the first part of the ventricles to depolarize? The answer is the left side of the septum. The septum is the first part of the ventricles to depolarize, and it is the left side of the septum that depolarizes first, shown in green. Septal depolarization therefore travels from left to right, as shown by the red arrow. Therefore, left-sided leads may normally show small septal Q waves within the red circle. This is because left-sided leads see the initial vector of ventricular depolarization as moving away from their left-sided location, red arrow. By left-sided leads, we mean one or more of these five leads, that is, leads 1, AVL, V4, V5, or V6. The important point being that the presence of small and narrow Q waves in one or more of the lateral leads may be normal, reflecting the normal process of left to right septal depolarization. In contrast, Q waves indicative of infarction tend to be larger, that is, deeper and or wider. That said, exceptions do exist, and the size of a Q wave does not always correspond to the likelihood of prior infarction. This is because sometimes Q waves may decrease in size with time, and sometimes they may even disappear, so that no marker of prior infarction is left. This is why we emphasize the need to simply describe what you see during descriptive analysis. We'll contemplate later during the clinical impression step what we think large or small Q waves noted during descriptive analysis might mean. This brings us to the next component in our QRST memory aid, which is the R in QRST. It is actually because of this R that I first developed this QRST memory aid. Most interpreters remember to look for Q waves and for ST-T wave changes. What many interpreters all too often overlook is the importance of assessing R wave amplitude in the anterior leads and to follow progression of R wave amplitude as one moves across the precordium. Reliance on the computer will not catch this oversight, since many computer systems are inexplicably just not programmed to pick up abnormal R-wave progression. So, a key reason for including the R as a routine part of our systematic approach is so that we will not miss the finding of a disproportionately tall R-wave in lead V1 and that we will also not miss findings such as incomplete right bundle branch block, certain Brugada ECG patterns, subtle anterior Q waves that may be important, and early transition that might suggest posterior infarction. Full discussion of the causes of a tall R wave in lead V1 extends beyond the scope of this ECG video, but Recognition of this finding should at least prompt consideration of RVH, posterior MI, WPW, right bundle branch block, and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So, what do we mean by the term R-wave progression? A picture is worth a thousand words. So if we take a transverse or horizontal section of the heart, where this is anterior, posterior, left, and right, the red arrow represents the predominant direction of the heart's electrical activity during ventricular depolarization. I'll draw this arrow larger to emphasize that not only is the predominant direction of the heart's electrical activity oriented leftward toward the location of the left ventricle, but also posteriorly, as the left ventricle lies both to the left as well as posteriorly within the thorax. If we now follow the six precordial chest leads 
Look at what happens to the relative height of the R wave compared to the depth of the S wave in leads V1 through V6 as we move across the chest. Note that the R wave becomes progressively taller as we move across the chest. The R wave often tops out, that is, reaches its maximum height before we reach lead V6, as happens here, with maximum R wave amplitude being seen in lead V5 within the blue rectangle. But the point to emphasize is that R wave amplitude normally increases as we move across the chest toward lateral precordial leads. This reflects the normal predominance of left ventricular forces. At some point, what is known as transition will occur, which we define as the changeover point where R wave height becomes greater than S wave depth. Normally, this occurs somewhere between lead V2 to V4. In this example, transition occurs between leads V3 to V4 within the large red oval. That is, the S wave in lead V3 is slightly deeper than the R wave is tall. But by lead V4, R wave height has clearly overtaken S wave depth. So transition occurs between leads V3 to V4, which is within the normal V2 to V4 range. So transition is normal. As we will emphasize momentarily, attention to the area of transition is often far more insightful than simply describing our wave progression. Let's make one more point on this horizontal section of the heart. We emphasized earlier that normal septal Q waves are often seen in one or more of the lateral leads. The reason for this is readily apparent on this transfer section of the heart. The first part of the ventricles to depolarize is the left side of the septum, small green rectangle. As a result, septal depolarization moves from left to right. It is because this initial ventricular vector of septal depolarization moves from left to right that left-sided leads, such as V5 or V6, will often see initial ventricular activity as moving away from their left-sided location, which is why these leads will often normally manifest small normal septal Q waves as seen within the red circles. For the same reason, from the perspective of leads V1 and V2, this normal left to right direction of septal depolarization may be viewed by leads V1 and V2 as seeing the initial vector of septal depolarization coming toward these leads, which is why you will often see a small positive initial deflection, that is R wave, in leads V1 and V2. This small positive initial deflection in these leads reflects normal septal depolarization. For this reason, leads V1 and V2 are often known as septal leads. And when the small initial R wave is lost in these leads, there may have been a septal infarction. Let's apply these concepts to a number of schematic tracings. Where is transition for the six chest leads shown here? If we focus on the two leads within the red rectangle, lead V1 appears as it normally does, with no more than a small initial R wave and a predominantly negative S wave. This reflects the fact that predominant forces in right-sided lead V1 are viewed as moving away from lead V1, or toward the left ventricle. However, R wave height becomes greater than S wave depth already by lead V2. So transition occurs early, that is between leads V1 to V2, which is before the usual normal V2 to V4 zone of transition. Clinically, the finding of early transition should prompt consideration of precordial lead misplacement, posterior infarction, and RVH. What about here? Between which two leads does transition take place? The answer is shown within the red rectangle. The QRS is predominantly negative in lead V4, but becomes more positive than negative by lead V5. 
so transition occurs between leads V4 to V5. This is a bit later than usual. Many conditions may result in delayed transition, as shown here. The term poor R-wave progression is often used when transition is delayed like this. And although we use the R for R-wave progression as our reminder in the QRST memory aid, this slide shows how suboptimal the term poor R-wave progression really is, because when conditions as opposite as LVH and RVH may both be seen, saying there is poor R-wave progression really doesn't tell us much. So despite continued frequent use of the term poor R-wave progression in practice, it is probably better to avoid this term and instead give the site of transition with simple description of what you see. We illustrate this concept in this last example. The area of transition once again occurs between leads V4 to V5. So, both of these examples show delayed transition with poor R-wave progression. But what's the difference in what we see? The difference is critical. There are Q-waves, or rather deep QS complexes, in leads V2, V3, and V4, red arrows. In addition, note that a small initial positive deflection, that is a small initial R-wave, is still present in lead V1. Persistence of a normal small initial R wave that we often will see in either leads V1 and or V2 suggests that the septum is still intact. But loss of R wave between V1 to V2, together with the large QS complexes seen here in leads V2, V3, and V4, is virtually diagnostic of prior anterior infarction. So if all we had said was poor R-way progression without describing the specifics of what we see, we'd have no idea that obvious prior infarction was present on one tracing, but that there was no indication at all of infarction on the other. Let's complete our discussion of R-wave progression with these last two schematic examples. Is it likely that there has been an infarct here? Let's start with descriptive analysis. Using the QRST memory aid to assess for Q waves and R wave progression. What do we see in leads V1 and V2? There is no initial positive deflection, that is initial R wave, in either lead V1 or V2. Instead, we see QS complexes in both leads V1 and V2 red arrows. But what do we see in lead V3 within the small red circle? We see that a definite small R wave has formed by lead V3. The fact that we have QS complexes in both leads V1 and V2 may indicate prior septal or anteroseptal infarction. But then again, it may not indicate prior infarction. Statistically, it turns out that most of the time when there is a QS complex in lead V1, or even in both leads V1 and V2, but that there is at least some positive deflection R wave by lead V3, that most of these patients have not had prior anteroseptal infarction. Potential reasons for a QS complex in leads V1 and V2 that is not the result of a prior infarction include lead misplacement, chest wall deformity, LVH, and normal variant, among others. The best way to resolve this, as always, is simply to describe what you see. So in my descriptive analysis, I'd write that there are QS complexes in leads V1 and V2. But I'd note in my clinical impression that clinical correlation, and ideally comparison with prior tracings, will be needed to determine what, if any, significance there might be to these QS complexes. Compare this to this last example, in which there are QS complexes not only in leads V1 and V2, but also in lead V3. Note that the QRS complex is narrow so that we are not dealing with left bundle branch block. 
Statistically, it becomes much more likely that lack of any R wave at all in V1, V2, and V3 does indeed reflect prior anteroceptal infarction. This is especially true when we also have a small Q wave in neighboring lead V4 within the red circle, but no Q wave at all in lateral leads V5 and V6. It's just unlikely that the Q wave we see here in lead V4 would be a septal Q wave in the absence of Q waves in leads V5 and V6 that are by far the most likely leads to show normal septal Q waves. So this patient has almost certainly had prior anteroceptal infarction. We are finally up to the S and the T of our QRST memory aid which should prompt us to look at all 12 leads for the presence of ST segment and T wave changes. Specifically, in addition to changes in ST T wave morphology, we are looking for ST segment deviations, either elevation or depression, that are above or below the ST segment baseline. To determine if the ST segment is elevated or depressed, we need a baseline. The baseline we favor is the PR segment, which is defined as the connecting line that extends from the end of the P wave until the beginning of the QRS complex, red arrow. That said, some clinicians prefer to use the TP segment instead of the PR. As shown here, the TP segment extends from the end of the T wave until the P wave, blue arrow. This leaves us with several choices as to which baseline we use. We emphasize that more important than whether one prefers the TP or PR segment baseline is to overview the entire tracing to assess for movement, artifact, and or baseline wander that may affect whatever baseline is selected. Please realize that no baseline is perfect. A problem with the PR baseline is that the PR may shorten with faster rates, but the reality is that the baseline may wander, depending on the patient's clinical condition. Therefore, do the best you can. It's fine to use either the PR or the TP segment as your baseline, depending on your preference. And we often end up using a combination of PR and TP segments depending on specifics of the case at hand. That said, most of the time, it probably doesn't matter which baseline you select to obtain the information you are seeking. For example, regardless of which baseline is used, there clearly is ST depression shown here, red arrow. For all practical purposes, the PR and TP baselines look to be the same. We'd interpret this picture as showing one to two millimeters of flat ST depression. Contrast this to the obvious ST elevation shown here, blue arrow. Again, for all practical purposes, the PR and TP baselines look to be the same. Using either baseline, we'd say there are two to three millimeters of ST elevation. Unfortunately, it is not always this easy, as shown on this example, which defies any baseline that might be selected. I still am unsure if the progressive stepwise elevation of the ECG baseline seen here does or does not represent significant ST elevation. Sometimes, you just have to do the best that you can. Discussion of the clinical significance of all forms of ST elevation and depression clearly extends beyond the scope of what we can accomplish on this ECG video. That said, we do want to present some general principles that should serve you well. This slide provides a reminder that certain leads on a 12-lead ECG may at times normally manifest even deep T-wave inversion without this indicating infarction or ischemia. We emphasize that this slide refers to the adult ECG, as T-wave inversion 
especially in several of the anterior leads, will often normally be seen as a juvenile T-way variant in children. A nice side benefit of this slide is that the leads that may normally show isolated T-wave inversion, not due to ischemia or infarction, are the same leads that may normally show isolated Q-waves, even deep and wide Q-waves, that are not the result of infarction. These are the leads. They are leads 3, AVF, AVL, AVR, and lead V1. Note the arrangement of these leads on this schematic 12-lead tracing. Isn't this sequential arrangement almost like a backward Z, as in the reverse of the Z that the popular movie hero Zorro used to inscribe? We merely suggest the image of a backward Z as a visual aid that may help you to remember these five important leads. Let's clinically apply this information. What are the three inferior leads? Two of them, lead 3 and lead AVF, are included among the five leads that may normally show either T-wave inversion and or isolated Q-waves. The third inferior lead is lead 2. As a result, lead 2 is often the deciding lead. Consider this example. Note the appearance of the complex in lead 3. The QRS is tiny, but it is in the form of a Q wave, or a QS complex. And the T wave in lead 3 is symmetrically inverted. This T wave is fairly deeply inverted when one considers the very small size of the QRS complex. That said, if we remember the five leads recalled by the reverse Z on this slide, lead three is one of them. The point to emphasize is that the Q wave and T wave inversion that we see here in lead three is not necessarily abnormal. That's because lead 3 is one of the leads that may normally show even deep T-wave inversion and or even large Q-waves without this necessarily being due to ischemia or infarction. The key is to look at the other inferior leads. Lead 2 shows no Q-wave and really no ST-segment deviation. Lead AVF does show ever so slight T-wave inversion, but it is minimal and there is no Q-wave in lead AVF. Therefore, if this patient was asymptomatic, it is highly likely that the QS complex and symmetric T-wave inversion seen as an isolated finding in lead 3 is not of concern. Pearl. The T-wave vector will often closely follow the QRS vector. What this means clinically is that if the QRS complex in one of the limb leads is predominantly negative, as it is here in lead 3, then the T-wave vector will also often be negative, that is inverted, as a normal response. Given that neither lead 2 nor lead AVF show any significant abnormality, Awareness of this pearl provides one more reason why the QS complex and T-wave inversion we see in lead 3 are unlikely to indicate ischemia or infarction, especially if this patient is asymptomatic. Just a few more points before we put all of these concepts together by interpreting some clinical examples. First, we emphasize that ST segment and T-wave shape together with the clinical history, are more important than the amount of ST deviation. Healthy young adults often manifest a surprising amount of benign ST elevation in the normal variant known as early repolarization. In contrast, acute infarction may sometimes manifest no more than subtle degrees of acute ST elevation. So we focus on the shape of the ST segment and the shape of the T wave. What then is a normal ST segment? We show a normal ST segment with a normal T wave here. 
The normal ST segment is round and smooth. It is not angulated. Instead, the end of the ST segment is rounded off so that it blends almost imperceptibly into the T wave. As a result, we often cannot tell where the ST segment ends and the T wave begins. In contrast, this is not normal. Note in panel A that there is a distinct angle that marks the end of the ST segment and distinguishes it from the beginning of the T wave, red arrow. Although these differences may seem subtle, is there any doubt that the rounded normal ST segment is different than the abrupt angulation that we see in panel A? This change is nonspecific. It does not mean that the patient is having an acute MI. The patient could have coronary disease. Then again, they may not. By the term nonspecific, we simply want you to recognize that the abrupt angulation we see in panel A is different from the smooth transition of the normal ST segment. Much of what we do in the descriptive analysis step of ECG interpretation is to simply describe what we see. How would you describe the appearance of the ST segment in panel B? Wouldn't you say that the ST segment is flat with virtually no T wave at all? Once again, this is a nonspecific change that will need to correlate clinically when we formulate our clinical impression. Finally, how would you describe what we see in panel C? And how does the ST segment in panel C differ from the one we just saw in panel B? Since we are still in descriptive analysis, all we need to do is describe what we see. The ST segment in C is flat. As shown by the dotted baseline, there is some ST depression, at the end of which we see a small but positive T wave. Whether this ST segment appearance is likely to indicate ischemia, drug effect, electrolyte disorder, or left ventricular strain awaits completion of descriptive analysis when we get to our clinical interpretation. Just a few more examples. Both D and E have been described as showing ST-T wave depression. What's the difference between them? Starting first with panel D, we would describe this as a sagging ST segment that shows asymmetric ST depression. That is, the initial downsloping portion of the ST segment, in red, goes down slower than the terminal upsloping segment, in green. It's hard to tell where the ST segment ends and the T wave begins, which is why ST-T wave depression may be a better term than just ST depression. That's our descriptive analysis of this finding. Clinically, this type of asymmetric ST depression is characteristic of LV strain when seen in left-sided leads in patients with voltage for LVH. It could also be due to ischemia, drug effect, especially if the patient is taking digitalis, electrolyte disturbance, tachycardia, or some combination of all of these entities. Clinical correlation is needed. Contrast this to the ST-T wave seen in panel E. Here, our descriptive analysis would be that there is symmetric T wave inversion that is at least moderately deep. The ST segment looks to be isoelectric, that is neither elevated nor depressed. We describe this T wave as symmetrically inverted because unlike what we saw in D, the initial downsloping portion of the ST segment, in red, is similar in slope to the terminal upsloping portion, in green, of the T wave. Clinically, the finding of symmetric T wave inversion in a patient with worrisome chest pain strongly suggests ischemia. Clinical correlation and comparison with prior tracings is needed to tell if this represents an acute change or 
versus a long-standing finding in a patient with coronary disease, but no new event. Note, there may be overlap. Assessment of ST-T wave depression is often not nearly as clear-cut as shown in these two examples. That's because some patients have both strain and ischemia, and the changes of one may mask the other not to mention that there may be baseline abnormalities as well as other potential causes of ST depression. Finally, both F and G show ST segment elevation. Keeping in mind that ST segment shape is more important than the amount of ST elevation, what's the difference between F and G? Let's start first with descriptive analysis of the ST segment shape shown in panel F. We describe the shape in F as ST segment coving or convex down. It may be easier to remember the shape as a frowny. With a little imagination, we've drawn the frowny in. Coved ST elevation is characteristic of the elevated ST segment shape during the early stages of acute injury and infarction. Contrast this to the pattern in G. We describe the shape of the ST segment in G as concave up. This resembles a smiley shape, which we have drawn in with a little imagination. Concave up or smiley shape ST elevation is characteristic of the elevated ST segment shape seen in early repolarization. While a smiley shape is more likely to reflect a benign pattern than a frowny or coved shape ST segment, not all patients read the textbook. And even concave up ST elevation may at times represent the early stage of acute infarction. But this visual aid may be helpful as a starting point. Ultimately, clinical correlation will be needed. Smiley shape ST elevation in an otherwise healthy young adult without symptoms is likely to be benign. In contrast, all bets are off in a patient who presents with worrisome symptoms, especially if older and with coronary risk factors. It's time to clinically apply what we have covered in this ECG video, which we'll do by interpreting a number of practice tracings. Here's the first case with the accompanying ECG. The patient has new onset chest pain. How would you proceed? Please note that we do want to reinforce the importance of following a systematic approach. So we'll interpret each tracing by the two-step process that we've emphasized throughout this video, beginning with descriptive analysis and its six components and then correlating the ECG findings we see based on the history we were given to come up with our clinical impression. For the purpose of time, which is limited, we will run through the first five components of descriptive analysis quickly so that we can focus on assessment of QRST changes and our clinical impression. Without further ado, let's get started. The rhythm in this first ECG is sinus, as determined by the presence of upright P waves with fixed PR interval in lead 2. The rate is about 75 per minute, as the R to R interval looks to be constant at four large boxes in duration, and 300 divided by 4 is 75 per minute. The intervals are normal, that is, the PR interval is not more than one large box in duration that is, not more than 0 0.20 second. The QRS is not more than half a large box in duration, that is, not more than 0 0.10 second. And the QT is not more than half the R to R interval. We determine the axis from assessment of the QRS in lead 1 at 0 degrees and lead AVF at plus 90 degrees. Since the net QRS deflection in both of these leads is more positive than negative, the mean QRS axis is normal. Regarding hypertrophy, there is no chamber enlargement, that is, no ECG sign of LAA, RAA, RVH, or LVH. 
The action begins with assessment of QRST changes. We look first for Q waves. Large Q waves are present in each of the three inferior leads, especially in leads 3 and AVF. Be sure to look at all 12 leads. We note that there are also small and narrow Q waves in leads V5 and V6. It's not yet time to contemplate whether these lateral Q waves are normal septal Q waves or due to infarction, since we are still in descriptive analysis. Assessment of R-wave progression shows transition to B between leads V3 to V4, which is normal. The most remarkable finding on this tracing relates to the ST-T wave changes we see. These are best assessed by applying the principle we call patterns of leads. By this I mean that the experienced interpreter looks at leads in a common lead area together. The three inferior leads are leads 2, 3, and AVF. Leads 3 and AVF look similar here, each showing some ST elevation with a T wave that looks more peaked than expected. We call this T wave appearance a hyper-Q change. Although neither the size of the Q wave nor the amount of ST elevation in lead 2 is nearly as much as in lead 3, we know that lead 2 findings are real because of what we see in neighboring leads 3 and AVF. Elsewhere, there is ST-T wave depression in leads 1, AVL, V2, V3, and V4, with nonspecific ST-T wave flattening in leads V1, V5, and V6. Putting this all together to formulate our clinical impression in this patient with new onset chest pain, the picture suggests acute inferior and probably also posterior infarction. We call this a STEMI because there is ST elevation in association with this acute MI, which suggests that even though large inferior Q waves have already formed, that significant benefit might still be obtained by acute reperfusion of the occluded coronary artery. The final point we make about interpretation of this tracing relates to the mirror image or reciprocal ST depression seen in a number of leads. In particular, lead 3 and AVL will very commonly show a mirror image picture of ST segment deviation in the setting of acute infarction. So it is the presence of this reciprocal ST depression that strongly suggests the event is still acutely evolving despite how large the Q waves in leads 3 and AVF already are. The next patient is an asymptomatic young adult who had an ECG ordered as part of an insurance health exam. Here is his ECG. How would you proceed? Once again, we will interpret the ECG systematically, going quickly through the first five components of descriptive analysis so that we can focus on assessment of QRST changes and our clinical impression. The rhythm is sinus at about 60 per minute. The PR, QRS, and QT intervals are clearly normal. The axis is normal at about plus 60 degrees. Given the young age of the patient, QRS voltage is probably not increased, so there is no chamber enlargement. This brings us to assessment of QRST changes. Beginning with the Q of QRST, there is a Q wave in lead AVR. That said, lead AVR is one of the five leads that will often manifest a large Q wave. Lead AVR looks down at the heart from the right shoulder, so from its perspective, electrical activity with ventricular depolarization moves away from lead AVR and should be expected to write a normal deep Q wave. Otherwise, there are small but definitely present narrow Q waves in both leads V5 and V6. These lateral Q waves are probably not significant, but they should be noted since we are still in our descriptive analysis. Regarding R-wave progression, 
transition occurs between lead V2 to V3 since the R wave has clearly become more positive than negative by lead V3. The interesting part of this tracing relates to assessment of ST-T wave changes. There is ST elevation, which is actually present in a number of leads. These include leads 1, 2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. The shape of these elevated ST segments is concave up, or smiley. In addition, Note a distinct notching that is present in a number of the leads with ST segment elevation. This notching occurs at the J point, or the junction between the end of the QRS with the beginning of the ST segment. Finally, there is no ST depression. The T wave is inverted in leads AVR and V1, but as we have previously emphasized, it is not at all abnormal to see T-wave inversion in either or both of these leads. Putting it all together, the significant findings we note on descriptive analysis in this asymptomatic young adult are that the rhythm is sinus and that there is concave up or smiley shape ST elevation with J-point notching in a number of leads. Impression. In an otherwise healthy and asymptomatic young adult, this ECG is consistent with ERP, or early repolarization pattern. ERP is usually benign, especially when seen in an otherwise asymptomatic young adult, as is the case here. In addition to the concave up shape of the elevated ST segments, the presence of J-point notching in one or more leads is highly characteristic of early repolarization. Against this being anything more serious is the very small size of the Q waves in leads V5 and V6, which are almost certainly normal septal Q waves, and the absence of any reciprocal ST depression in this young adult man without symptoms. What if this patient was older and instead of being asymptomatic, the patient had new onset chest pain? The point to emphasize is that our descriptive analysis does not change. It is only the clinical interpretation that changes. If the patient was older, then voltage criteria for LVH would be met. However, I would still think it less likely that this patient was having an acute infarction because in addition to the upward concavity shape of the ST elevation, there is prominent J-point notching. The Q waves are small, R wave amplitude is not diminished in the anterior leads, and there is no reciprocal ST depression. That said, the ST segments are elevated, and in the absence of a prior ECG showing the same finding, if the history was new chest pain, the onus would be on us to prove that none of the ST elevation was new. Finally, if the history was that of pleuritic chest pain following a recent upper respiratory infection, the finding of ST elevation in as many leads as we see here, should prompt consideration of acute pericarditis. So we can imagine at least three different clinical interpretations with the same descriptive analysis, depending on what the clinical history is. The last patient is an older adult with atypical chest pain and this ECG. How would you interpret this tracing? By the systematic approach, the rhythm is sinus at a rate of between 65 to 70 per minute. The PR, QRS, and QT intervals are normal. The axis is normal at about plus 60 to plus 70 degrees. Given the age of the patient, voltage for LVH is clearly satisfied as the R wave alone in lead V5 is 28 millimeters. This brings us to assessment of QRST changes. Looking for Q waves, we see a fairly deep and wide Q wave in lead AVL. It would be easy to overlook this Q wave if we were not systematic in our descriptive analysis.
Note that there is again a deep Q wave in lead AVR. But as previously mentioned, a Q wave in AVR is so common that this finding need not be included in one's descriptive analysis. Lead V1 is interesting in that there appears to be a tiny initial positive deflection for the first two beats in this lead, but a QS for the third beat. So we really don't know if a Q wave or QS complex is or is not present in lead V1. That said, there is no doubt that a definite small R wave is present by lead V2 so that even if a QS was present in lead V1, as an isolated finding, it would not be significant. As to the R, R wave progression appears to be normal with transition occurring between lead V3 to V4. This leaves us with assessment of ST-T wave changes. One could either specify all leads that show ST-T wave abnormalities, or say that the changes are present inferiorly in leads 2, 3, and AVF, as well as in anterolateral leads. Or one might simply say that there is diffuse ST segment coving and fairly deep symmetric T wave inversion. Our point in this discussion is to highlight how a balance must be struck in one's interpretation between noting all findings in all leads without necessarily writing a book about all that is seen. Although there is some variation in ST-T wave morphology in the above mentioned leads, for practical purposes, the principal abnormalities that are seen in multiple leads are ST segment coving and fairly deep symmetric T wave inversion. Did you notice any ST segment elevation? It would be all too easy to ignore that there is slight but real ST elevation in several leads if one was not systematic in their approach. It looks like there is slight ST elevation in lead AVL. This is easy to overlook because of the relatively small amplitude of the QRS complex in this lead, but this finding is potentially relevant given the definite Q wave seen in this lead. Similarly, there appears to be slight but real ST elevation in lead V1. Finally, there are one to two millimeters of ST elevation in lead AVR. For many years, lead AVR has been the unappreciated lead. We are finally realizing that in the setting of diffuse ST depression or T wave inversion, as seen here, that ST elevation in lead AVR may in fact reflect a reciprocal change that supports the likelihood of significant underlying coronary disease. Let's put these descriptive analysis findings together given the context of an older adult with atypical chest pain. We would love to have a prior ECG available on this patient for comparison with this current tracing. Unfortunately, no prior ECG is available, so we have to make our interpretation based on this ECG alone. The rhythm is sinus, there is definite LVH. Although a portion of the T-wave inversion we see may reflect the LVH repolarization abnormality that we call LV strain, it clearly is much more than that. Rather than the asymmetric ST-T-wave depression that is characteristic of strain, T-wave inversion is deeper, much more diffuse, and for the most part symmetrically inverted. In addition, ST segments are diffusely coved or frowny, and there is some ST elevation, especially in lead AVR. Neither the overall ECG pattern nor the history here suggests a new acute event, but we strongly suspect ischemia that could be new. Whether this patient needs to be admitted to the hospital and or whether they need cardiac catheterization to define the anatomy are decisions best made by the clinician on the scene. But this ECG clearly suggests ischemia. That's it for today.
We have covered a lot of ground. Hopefully you now feel much more comfortable in your systematic approach to ECG interpretation and in your assessment of QRST changes. This is Ken Grauer saying goodbye for now. Du plus loin que me revienne l'ombre de mes amours anciennes, du plus loin du premier rendez-vous.